fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and I'm the man at the controls, Al Warren. Um, Co-hosting today, we've got Eric Shapiro, the doctor. How you doing, Al? I'm delicious. Good to be here. Oh, excellent. Oh, just the way I like you. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got uh, a newbie that we're breaking in hard, uh, David <laughs> North <laughs> Martino. Hey, Al. Hey, yeah. Eric. <laughs> How you doing, David? Yeah. Hey. Now you know why he has to drink. Yes. Uh, right. <laughs> it's a recent thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm going to pour one right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that would be a good time. He sits, yeah, right. with, he sits with his pussy and drinks. <laughs> right. <laughs> fair he, enough. Fair enough. He's a yeah. cat aficionado, and yes. he's got a uh, he's a, he's a he's a, do- a caddy dog, like a, or a oh, caddy right. daddy, whatever you call them. Oh, daddy. I couldn't yeah. I couldn't have imagined you meaning anything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's me. My cat is coming to see me as we uh, as we're talking about this. You yeah. called Excellent. him. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> I love, it. love good, good, good cats. Now, <laughs> today we are talking to. Speaking of horror, we're talking. Um, <laughs> uh, Martino, you're a horror author, so you, so we've got another one here. Um, Absolutely, written a ton of books. Uh, Greg F. Gafuni, um, thank you for being oh, it's here. Oh, Gafuni, it's Gafuni. Gafuni, Greg F. Gafuni, thank you for being here. Thanks, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. We'll see if you say that at the end. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Yeah, well. And so, now you've got a couple of new books out, but uh, before we get into that, um, let's, let's go back to, to where it all started. Like, talk about how, how did you get into um, writing and writing horror? Like, was this something you did from a kid, or is this something that just came along lately, or where, where did it come from? Uh, it was a little bit of both, actually. I, 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 I come from a family of teachers. My parents were both teachers. So I had a, I was introduced very early on to, uh, to books and reading. And I could, you know, I could read before I went to school. Um, and writing was always something that just kind of came to me. I, it was just something I always did. Um, even before I could write, I have an older sister and I used to dictate things to her and she would write them down. <laughs> Um, oh, nice. uh, and she was thrilled when I learned how to write, trust me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it just was sort of a natural thing for me to, to get things out of me to write. Um, and I, as for horror, I, I never, it's interesting. I never really started off to be a horror writer. I still don't really consider myself a horror writer. I just, I just consider myself a writer. I, I'm, I'm mostly working horror and crime, but I, and I, and I mean, I don't have any, uh, Sometimes the communities get upset when you say that because you're, you're denigrating. And I don't, I don't mean it like that. It's just, I just kind of write what I write and it's whatever category people want to put it into. That's fine. Um, it's, it's generally I, pretty dark though, isn't it? it, it when you say yeah. it's consistent across your novels, whether it's crime it is, yeah. Or, 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 yeah. Um, very, yeah. It's, I mean, when I do crime, I'm doing more of the Jim Thompson stuff, not, you know, cozy mysteries. So right, yeah, it's right. pretty dark stuff, but it, it's uh in terms of how i get into it i it just sort of was something that i always wanted to do um and i did it you know as as an amateur for growing up and and then i my life kind of went in a different direction and um i got involved in some other things um and i had to kind of find my way back um which i did um in my early 30s and uh uh, decided to give it a, a real shot professionally. And, you know, I was married at the time and I was coming off of a company that I w- w- had owned and had done fairly well. So I said to my wife, you know, look, if I don't try this now, I'm never going to. And so she said she had, she was working her way up the corporate ladder at the time. And she would, said, well, you know, that was five years. So. And I said, well, it sounds fair. So <laughs> she gave me five years and she said, if after five years, you haven't done anything. You got to, go get a job and, you know, 
pursue it part time. And I said, fine. And four and a half years in, I sold my, my novel, my first novel. And that was uh, the bleeding season. Yeah. Yeah. Which really kind of put me on the map. So I just made it. <laughs> I, yeah. just got in, I just got under the wire. Oh, wow. And uh, what, I, what I really love about Greg's uh, fiction, guys, is um, I haven't read so much of the crime stuff, but on, on the end of the darker fiction, what some people call horror, is it's, uh, it registers, registers to me more as surrealism. It's like, uh, it's kind of like a nightmare state, like a silent scream. And I remember, uh, the first book of yours I read was, um, I think it was The Rain Dancers. Um, okay. yeah, and, and which is a novella. And I remember what really made an impression on me was that and this, this uh, is the same for all your books. I think I've read like eight or 10 of them now. Uh, there's a saturated emotion from the first second to the last. Like, uh, right. and I, that, that's when I said, I'm like, okay, I'm really in the presence of a major leaguer. Like from, from beginning to end, it's incredibly immersive on the level of atmosphere and feeling and it never lets up and you've got it under control the entire time. And, uh, of course that's an intuitive call. Like not every reader is going to hear it or pick up what you're putting down, but I think it's, uh, potent in a way where that's why, why you've gotten on the map. And it's, so I was curious to hear about that, you know, sort of being emotionally available to your writing and, uh, right. how you bring those feelings across. Well, there's kind of a two, as you, you know, this already, but there's a, there's kind of two parts to everything that I write. There's the surface story, which I try to make, you know, entertaining. And I try to make it self-contained so that if people just want, if the reader just wants to experience that, great, you know, and hopefully it works for them. But then there's also a subtext. There's another story going on underneath. And if they want to get in there, they can get in there. And uh, that's where a lot of the real emotion comes from, I guess, for me. It's, it's just, I think Robert Dunbar, who wrote The Pines, who's a, a great writer, a good friend, he coined a, a term called, uh, 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 what, do you, what do you call it, acting, uh, method. method. Oh, right? yeah. A method, right? Like method yeah. acting. And yeah. when he said it, it really hit me because I thought, yeah, that's what I do. I didn't really realize that's what I did, but that's what I do. So are you kind of um, drawing from your own things. It's interesting because I think you're, you're often in the third person, aren't you? Is it because... It always feels like Sometimes. the first person, because I always uh, emotionally pick it up like it is the first person, whether you're in first or third. And I guess that goes hand in hand with what you're saying. It's like a method. You're tapped in at that angle. It's a, it's a method sort of process. Yeah, it goes back and forth. I mean, it just it depends on what the what the book calls for. I mean, certain things just lend themselves better to first person. Certain things lend themselves better to third. It just you know. And there's times when it goes. I mean, the bleeding season is a good example. When I first wrote that, it was third person. I ended. I got about a quarter of the way through it. I said, no, this has to be first person. God, yeah, it's funny because I, I sometimes have uh, trouble remembering when I think back on your books, which is not in, in, not in any way a negative comment. It's just that because either way, either way, it's so on the axis of that emotional um, that emotional expression. Right. Well, yeah. I, I think if you don't hit that, it, I don't really if you're not hitting that, then it's just, it's, it's all surface stuff, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's, for me, it's just, it's more of a purge, you know? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Well, said, trying yeah. to get stuff out. <laughs> I'm trying to yeah, get things the hell out of me and that's the best way to do it. That's yeah. I, I remember um, your, your novella Midnight Gods, which is more recent, which is more uh, a commentary on, you know, the Trump years and in terms of uh, everybody being afraid and tribalism and partisanship. And uh, it's right. a story where there's a, uh, a virus, um, or, or in, in other words, fear is functioning as a virus, like fear is a contagion right. in a community, and right. then it's implied that it goes beyond that community. I remember when I first read it, I felt like I was, um, I think this is the word you ultimately used, but it was the feeling I had for sure, like I was being smothered. I was like, oh my God, he's getting mm -hmm. to like a panic attack level of yeah. emotional yeah. potency. It's like I'm having ice port, port all over me. And it's just the, the fact that you, uh, as an artist, can tap that always astonishes me. That is, uh, and I'm curious if you don't oh, thank mind speaking you. I to, appreciate it. Oh, definitely, yeah. If you don't mind speaking to, like, uh, personally, and you know, I don't want to overstep any boundaries, but is there a certain level of anguish or, or neurosis or something that that comes from that you're tapping into? Or, like, um, like are you, when you're in you know, that there, method? I'm sure there is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there, is. there has when, to be. Um, when you're in that method process, do you feel tormented? Is it difficult? Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. I mean, without, you know, it's hard to talk about sometimes because you sound, you know, you don't, you don't want to sound. Uh, you know, pretentious, pretentious but yeah. 
you know, but it's, it is, it's, it is torturous for me. I'm, I'm definitely in the Dorothy Parker camp. I hate writing. I love having, <laughs> oh, um, okay, yeah, yeah. you know, the process itself is not, I always envy people when they say, Oh, I, you know, it's so much fun to write. And I wrote this story and it was so much fun. I think, wow, that must be awesome. That must be so cool. <laughs> oh, right. For yeah, me, it's, it's like, blast, I'm, yeah. I'm just, it's like, I'm, I feel like it's, you know, I'm being pummeled with a bat through the whole thing. Oh, but man, then when it's done, when it's done, I feel a sense of relief and I hopefully like what I end up with. Yeah. But yeah, you, it's many, very it's very draining. How many novels are in the body of work now? And you include novellas of that. Like how how many are there now? Uh, a little over twenty. Are there any? Because from my exposure to you, so I've probably read half of them or just shy of half. And I've always thought they're they're dependably great. I mean I, I always I think Thanks. your your uh, your ground game is fantastic. So are there any that you don't like or that you feel soft about? You know, honestly, no. Um, okay. Yeah, there's some I like better than others. Um, there was a there were a couple that I there was one that I wrote called Nightwork, which was actually the first novel I ever wrote. It was okay. the first published, but it was the first novel I ever wrote <clears throat> that was initially published um, by a, a small house when I was starting out. And it, they made me do some well, they didn't make me, but they're, they I kind of made some changes to it that, that I didn't really like to kind of sit there their their deal and i was kind of disappointed in that but i i got a chance you know a few years later uh with uh down and out books they're the, they're primarily my crime uh uh publisher they re- reissued it as a like an anniversary um kind of like what, what journal stone did with bleeding season mm-hmm. um and uh allowed me to kind of do a preferred author's edition. So I was able to kind of get that. So I can say now, no, <laughs> but oh, I think God, the other God. thing, I, th- I think the other reason that I can say no is that I didn't start out that early. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't become a published, right. My, you know, I was what in my mid to late thirties when I finally hit. So um, there was a long period of time there. There was a long learning curve. There was a, a lot of uh, many years of, of rejection and failure, um, which I think made me better and made me. Um, it's one of the things that I think is unfortunate about the, the self-publishing craze today is that I think if you've established in other ways and then you do it, I think it's fine. But to, to not go through that, I think it's detrimental. You know, failure is good. Failure makes you stronger. Failure is what makes you better. Um, it's what challenges you. And it, it, it can bury you if you let it. But, and, you know, there were times it came close to burying me. I went through almost five straight years of it. Um, but you, you feel but that as I a... Think, it depends. Go ahead. How do you know that... So for you personally, I, I had the simil- I have the similar experience as you do to writing and I had the same experience about getting published finally and then doing some of my own, but, and the emotional drain and, and, and the dislike kind of, kind of the, the struggle to get through it and then the relief when it's done. Um, but with all of that, when, where, do, where do you get the confidence to say, yeah, this is ready and this is, I want to publish this or I want, I, you, do you know uh, what I'm saying? You know. To send the story in. You know, I, one of the, one of my mentors gave me the best piece of advice, which was when you, if you're going to do this, be fearless. If you can't be fearless, get out of the game. Um, and it's okay to be afraid. That doesn't mean you can't be afraid. You can't be uncertain. It's not about being arrogant, but you know, <laughs> and I certainly am not comparing the two. But it's like, you know, my dad was a, was a World War II combat veteran. I said to him once when I was a little person, weren't you afraid? And he said, well, yeah, anybody in their right mind was, you're terrified. But you won anyway. Wow, yeah. You know, and that always stuck with me. And when this guy, this mentor of mine said that to me, it reminded me of that, you know, conceptually. Again, I'm not comparing the two by any means. But, it, it's, but the idea that if you wait around to be sure, <laughs> you know, Hmm. And but you're how totally you... confident in everything you do. You're, you're never going to do anything. Number one, and number two, you know, you know who's totally confident a hundred percent of the time and thinks that they're geniuses. People that that aren't. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, <laughs> the the idea of being uncertain and of being 
that's that's the pro that's part of the process, man. That's part of being that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's I think that's I think you're better off having. They should be on sorry. But but how um, do you choose these emotional? Because uh, you're you're talking about uh, very emotional points in your books, uh, like they really right. come out. So how do you choose what you're going to share with the world? You know, I, I think I'd be lying to you if I said I do. I I it just I it just, I just do it. Whatever needs to come out, that's what I put down. Because I, I always, it's like when I mentor people now, I say, look, you can always edit. You can always take something out. You know what I mean? But don't ever be in a position where you didn't put enough in. So, you know, like Blake Hemingway, you know, bleed all over the page. You can clean it up. You can, <laughs> you, can, you can mop up some of that if you don't want to use it later. So I tend to just put it all out there. And I try to be as fearless as possible. And sure, I, look, I go through a process with every, and, it's, and it is literally it's so common now that even I see it coming. It's kind of ridiculous, but I still go through it. Every book I write, every single one, without fail, I hit a point where I do the whole, you know, George C. Scott used to do the same thing on every film. I just get blinding drunk and go into a rage, and this book sucks. <laughs> I suck. You know, every I do sucks. Why am I wasting my time with this? This is terrible. You know, that's when I that's when day. I block uh, Greg on my phone when that happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I, just, I, I take yeah, sure Eric knows. Yeah, the friendship. Yeah. Yeah. Eric knows when I hit that. Yeah, just we'll yeah, yeah. I'll um, catch up with you later. Yeah, I'll see. You. I'll see you in a couple of days. But yeah, but yeah. Then once, you know, I get through that. It's it's yeah, I've just sort of incorporated it as part of my process. You know, that there's yeah. going to be that doubt. There's going to be those things. Did I pick the right things? Am I? Am I? You know, is this too far? And, you know, there's times when I, and I'm sure you guys can relate to this, there's times when you're writing something that you're not, you know, it, it takes a certain type of personality to, to live with a writer because you're not always pleasant when you're writing oh, something. Oh, you're ecstatic. You know? yeah. Oh, my God, yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't mean it. You don't, it's not directed at anybody. It's just you're going through this thing trying to, you know, trying to do exactly what you just had. Where do I go with it? What do I, you know, what do I put in? What do I don't? What do I allow myself to feel with this? What do I pull back from? And it's... So I think it's, but I think those are all good things. I mean, that's, that's art, man. That's, that's a, you know, it's an, it's an it adventure. Easy, it's, a, it's a journey. Yeah. But I mean, it, I don't think it should be easy necessarily. I think if, I think if you're just kind of sitting back and flicking them out there, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't mean they're bad necessarily, but I mean, I don't really see the point of that myself. That's just me. Yeah. It's interesting. You brought up uh, George C. Scott, because this one thing I was telling the guys before we all got on is that you're an atypical writer. I think this is something that you and I related on when we found each other on the scene. Like you're not the guy um, at a cafe with glasses, like, you know, never no. you know, tapping out, <laughs> you know, uh, you and I are like a pair of brutes. I'm like, you're, you're a tough, tougher guy. And like, it's interesting, George C. Scott, because he was tough as nails, but he was also, oh, yeah. and this applies to you too. He's very sensitive. He was a beautiful person. I mean, he, uh, I just watched the uh, Exorcist three in the last couple months and, uh, it was like just Love the, uh, yeah, um, the blend. I mean, he's so tough and he commands total authority at the same time, a totally, you know, emotionally present and sensitive. Yeah. Just, just, yep. you know, just, there's a sweetness to him that's undeniable. Um, yeah. and, uh, I was wondering on, on that note, an interesting question is like, do you generally find yourself, uh, mixing in with other writers? Um, uh, is it, is it more, you know, is it, I, I, obviously it depends on the writer, but is it, are, are writers the sort of crowd you rush toward, or do you sort of hang hang at the back of the class? Um, I'm, I hang toward the back of the class. I'm more yeah. that guy. Yeah. Um, not that I have. I'm not necessarily. I'm not necessarily repelled by other writers, although there are yeah. a few. But, <laughs> but uh, I just I'm not big on the whole group dynamic. I never have been. Um, I don't like the whole sort of clicky kind of. Um, I tend to have small circles, uh, in both in, in, as a writer and as a, just as a human being. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not big on, I don't join organizations. I don't, I'm not an awards guy. I don't care about any of that yeah. stuff. Um, uh, people that do got knock yourself out. It's whatever. It, I don't, I don't, I have my own thoughts on, you know, this Eric, I don't, you know, I, yeah. I don't like competition in the air. I don't think that's what it yeah. should be about. You know, it's um, funny. I, I agree with you. The, the only area in which I disagree is I think that I should win. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, if they're going to get them like, out, yeah, like, yeah, 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 like, angle I um, come in it's just, it's like, yeah. Well, yeah. I think, you know, and I think that's why some people have been baffled by me in this, in this, particularly in the horror genre, 
is that I, it's sometimes I think taken as I'm being superior or I'm being, it, it's nothing. Like I, I, they need to believe me when I say I really don't care. Yeah, you're just I indifferent. Don't care. You're, you're neutral. I'm totally indifferent. I don't, yeah. I don't need an award to tell me that I'm a good writer. I, it doesn't matter to me. The only yeah. awards I've ever gotten that really meant something to me was I, I've got a couple of uh, Reader's Choice uh, awards that I got a couple yeah. of plaques oh, nice. that I have. Uh, th- those mean a lot to me because those came directly from readers. Yeah. You know, I don't need, uh, I, I just, I just don't need my peers to tell me how wonderful I am all the time. I just, I don't yeah. need that. And I don't mean that in a, I'm not trying to be a jerk. It's just, I don't, it, it's that, no interest to me. I, I like it when people like energy. what I do and they, they, we have, you know, we have common respect for each other and that's great. And that's, you know, and like I say, if that's your bag, Great. Yeah. Knock yourself out. It's just well, so, Aaron, no, it's I, a terrible thing. Hey. I, 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 I agree. I totally. Uh, I was going to ask you, Al. I hate groups. I hate that. <laughs> well, no, because, because you have to form yourself to fit the group in the way exactly. that it's supposed to be. And in order for you to win anything, you have to follow the rules, so to speak. And, and, and if you don't, you're accused of sour grapes. And right. It's sort of a right. built-in. There's a built-in defense mechanism with that crowd. Where if you're critical, it's because, well, it's because sour grapes. But trust me. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. not jealous. I, I, I agree with that. I agree with all of that. I, I, I just, I'm just not into it. Plus, a lot of times these groups make you feel bad about yourself, in my experience. I don't, they, well, they're never positive for me. See, part of the problem, it's, I, I liken it. It's not as bad. Because, listen, there's a lot of really good people in these groups and a lot of really good writers. Yeah. Let's not pretend that there isn't because because there are and very good people too. Um, but I think there's there's something common in my experience, my life experience with groups that runs kind of parallel to mobs. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, yeah, mobs yeah. often start <laughs> off. I don't mean the mob. Like we can talk about that too if you want. But yeah, yeah, but I mean, we'll, we'll get there. In a sec. We'll get there. Great. Um, <laughs> but you know they they generally start off very well intentioned, but they're kind of doomed to, to, to become something besides that. And so for me, I just look at that and I, my biggest problem with it is I just don't see what that has to do with what I do. Right. If yeah, somebody yeah, else yeah. does awesome. If you do and plenty of people do, and that's great. I, I really don't have anything against people that, that want to do that. It's just not my thing. I don't, it's, it's and I wish that I got the same amount of respect for that that that, that, that they demand that I give them. Right, um, right, right. You it's know, interesting. Uh-huh. It exists in every field. It's like whether you're a dentist or an insurance salesman. There, you know, there's a club where you get together yeah. and you mix and you right. mingle and you give awards. And it's, I think it's part of the pro-social nature of our species, and it's fine. But like you said, it's not. Uh, is the word endemic? It's not um, part and parcel of the trade. It has nothing to do with it. Well, yeah. And and the other problem with it is, Eric, is that it becomes very insular in the sense that it it becomes this little bubble where people start to believe that if you're not a part of that, you're somehow not really there. You're not really in the right. You're not, you're not a world out there, you know? Yeah. Are you kidding me? It's, it's like, there's an entire, you know, industry out there that's got nothing to do with what you're talking about exactly so for me it's just not about that i i'm here to do my work to get my books out and, and that's it i'm here to to write what i write you know people can throw whatever they want i'm an artist i i create art and i get on with my life that being said um um is it important to get good feedback from other writers for you like that, not no. not in a group set, but let's say some writer you you like yourself, uh, you might mm-hmm. not know them, and if they turn around and do a review on your book or give you a you know a whatever a four star or whatever they do, it, it, does that mean something? I, listen, I'm always I'm always uh, pleased and flattered when somebody likes what I do, but I learned a long time ago to not take reviews and things like that. Don't, don't, 
don't take the good ones. Don't, you know, don't, don't take those too seriously. And don't take the bad ones too seriously either. Just, you know, take them for what they are and move on. I mean, there are, there writers that I respect and who, if they read something of mine, maybe ahead of publication or something and they have, they offer some, sure, absolutely. There's people like that. It's not like I'm totally, you know, off on my own somewhere, but I mean, there's, there's certainly other writers that I respect and that I, there's plenty of them. Um, there are some that I've uh, given work to and they've, they've made it better. You know, I'm, I'm certainly open to, I've worked with some great editors. I mean, I've, I'm always open to, you know, like I've said before, I, mean, I don't care if it's the, the mailman, if you've got a good idea, I'll use it. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, the idea is to man. make the work better. If you can make <laughs> it better, I'll make it better. And I sure there's other writers, but I mean, I don't have the, and I don't necessarily, I think if you're starting out, it's probably there's pros and cons to the whole sort of group dynamic with that. I never did a lot of that. I did a lot more one-on-one. I was fortunate enough to have a couple of guys that were ahead of me in the business that saw something in me and kind of took me under their wing and, you know, guided me and gave me some excellent advice. And, and that was good for me, you know, for other people, maybe a bigger group dynamic works for them. If it does, God love you. Go do that. But I've never really, that's never really interested me. And it's never really, I've never really, I don't feel I, I've really required it. New books, Blue Hell. Um, let's talk about the, the story. Where, where does a story like this come from for you? Like, how, do, how does it, how does it get into Greg's head? Are you sleeping one night or you see someone in a, in a bookstore? Or like, where, where does the, the characters come from? And, and the storyline come from? You know, it's interesting. Usually for me, it's the characters first. The characters come to me and then if I listen to them, their stories are kind of born out of them. Um, and that's where I get, you know, the plot comes from the character. But if you were to ask me where, you know, and I've been asked, anybody who's a writer that's been a writer for more than 10 minutes, you know, has answered the question, <laughs> where do you get your ideas? You know, about a million times. And the honest answer is, I have no idea. I have no idea where they come from. I know that they come, and I know that they probably come from within me somewhere, but I don't really question it. I know the pieces that come from me that are definitely coming from me. Um, for me, it's initially more like a puzzle. I tend to, I very rarely have an idea or a concept. I think I've done it twice in my entire career. 20 plus years that I ever had an idea and sat down and started writing it. I, things kind of nest in my mind for long, long periods of time, like usually several years. But when you say you listen um, to your characters, um, what kind of relationship do you have with your, with your, with your players? Depends on who they are. Depends on what, what I'm doing. Um, it can be a little bit of everything. It can be friendly. It can be, unfriendly it can be you know tough you know a little some are a little easier it just depends on what you're doing like blue hell for example is an interesting piece because i had a short story that i'd written called the level at night and it was published years ago and, and it's been published in i don't know like three or four anthologies but i always thought there was more to it like i always thought there was more to that story that i you know there was something it was a decent story i liked it but i i felt like there was there was something more there and so i wrote it again and i wrote it up to a certain point and then i kind of had an idea of like an ending an end piece but i didn't have anything in the middle and i it really stumped me for probably close to a year and then i would you know put it aside go back to it put it aside and i just i couldn't seem to get that piece and it's one of the few times i've ever collaborated because i wrote the, the book with sandy deluca who's a dear friend and an old friend of mine i've known her since the 80s She's a very accomplished artist and author herself. And I, I sent it to her and I just said, look, take a look at this. Is, it, is there anything here? <laughs> you know, what do you think? And she read it and she said, yeah, there's, there's definitely something here. She said, but you're missing the, I said, yeah, there's nothing in the middle here. There's, there's nothing to tie it all together. And she said, well, you know what? I have a piece. She, she had these, this, this, these characters and this, this piece of story that she had removed from a novel that she had, written that didn't really fit in that novel so she pulled it out and left it aside and it was just kind of laying around she said let me play around it and see what i can do with it and she kind of plugged it in 
then sent it back to me and it was perfect. It was like, God, there it is. There's the bridge. So I, we edited it and sort of, you know, cleaned it up and, you know, brought it all together, tied up all the, all the loose ends and it, and it, and it came together perfectly. And that was kind of a unique situation because I've never, I've never done that before. And it was, it was kind of two, two people just kind of getting in sync with it, you know? So it, sometimes it comes together like that. Um, other times it just, like I say, the things just sit in my head for a long, long time. And then when it feels like it's ready to write, I write it. And I just go with it. I don't outline. I, I, I take notes. I have notebooks. Like I drive my wife crazy. I have notebooks all over the house. <laughs> um, so I'm always scribble. Oh, wait a minute, I'll scribble something down so I don't forget. Um, but I, uh, you know, I don't really outline very, I, I do more notes. More, it's mostly continuity stuff because I don't like to, I like to know where I'm going, but I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be too rigid either. You know, I want to be able to still go in different directions if that I wasn't anticipating or, and again, to go back to listening to the characters, sometimes the characters want to want to take you in a certain direction. You have sometimes you want to ignore that and be disciplined. And other times you need to listen to them. And you need to go in that direction. It just depends on, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, a piece by piece thing. I don't have like a blanket kind of way of doing it, I guess. Right. Right. So when you say method writing, so it's actually like being in the situation, being in the characters and going right. through with it. But, but how do you fit your subtext into it? Like, how does that, how, how do you get your characters to follow what you want them to do or as in the subtext, not necessarily as the, the main story? I think with the subtext, that's where the emotion is. And that's where, not that there's none in the surface athletes on there too, but, but that's really where you have to deeply, deeply draw from yourself. And where it really does become method where you have to draw from your own experiences and try to find parallel things that can, or in some cases, things that are very, very close. And you try to, you know, you just try to draw from them. And, and it's, it's a balancing act because you don't want the subtext to, to ruin the surface either, you know? So you have to be careful. You have to be balanced. You have to have, they both have to exist, kind of coexist without, you know, screwing up the other one. You know, they have to kind of maintain on their own. But I think for me, it's just a matter of that's where I start to pull out the real deep stuff out of me. The, the pain that I'm exploring or whatever it is that I'm exploring, that's, that's where I put it. And if you do it in a way that complements the surface, you know, in other words, you don't want to disrupt it. That works for me. Uh, did you find that Sandy fit in well on the emotional side of things? Like you had intu an intuitive connection? <clears throat> um, we kind of have for a long time. We're like really good friends. Oh, nice, um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think to a degree, um, she was really the, the perfect person to, to approach with it because Sandy is a very, very skilled uh, with surreal fiction. She's very, very good. Oh, wow. And that's kind of, her, kind of her thing. And so I, and this was, and Blue Hell is a very surreal, I mean, kind of David Lynch-esque kind of piece uh, where there's essentially three stories that are unfolding and you don't know how they're connected until the end. Hmm. Um, but her, her sensibilities as a writer were, were perfect for that, for that piece. And it sounds to me the way the way you described it, she held up the middle story. So it was it was somewhat of a compartmentalized approach where you weren't under that pressure to sort of uh, pass it back and forth and blend your voices sentence by sentence. Or am I misunderstanding that? Well, we kind of, well, yeah. Generally, you're right. I mean, there there was a point where we had to do that so that it had that flow. Yeah. You know, but it it was a little bit. I know what you mean. It was a little bit later in the process where we could just sort of find that singular you know, thing, and then just, just sort of edit it together so that it, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, <laughs> it's like magic, uh, it, it looks, you know, yeah. there's, there's a way you're doing it, but it looks like it's, it's seamless. It's not, but it looks that way. Right, right. So. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it always sounds to me, because I've only, I've only co-written prose as a journalist with my wife. I've done it like 10 times where we just pass it back and forth, but there's a, a deep right. trust and mutual respect and it's pretty, pretty painless, but, uh, the idea of sitting in a room with a co-writer, especially with, with prose. I mean, I've done it a lot with screenplays, but uh, which are, are kind of a lighter form in terms of the amount of verbiage. Right. But the idea of being right. in a room and brainstorming and being like, all right, do we set this in a basement or do we set it in the hallway? <laughs> and it's like every single thing. Like, I think I would, I would lose my mind. 
Well, it's funny, you know, Ron, you know, if you guys know Ronald Nelfi, who's a great writer, a yeah. really good guy, good friend of mine. And we've been sort of knocking around a, a novel uh, back and forth for uh, geez, almost two years now. And we, we sort of work on it when we have time, which is not a lot. Um, and, you know, it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's, I, I think we both, we, we have a similar kind of style and we have a, I have a great deal of respect for Ron. I know he respects me and we, we have a, you know, we can, we can, we, we found a thing that works, but it's, it's difficult. It's a much harder process to, to sort of go back and forth like that and find your footing, yeah. and make sure you're going to go in the right direction and do the right things. Blue Hell worked out a little bit better because it was, it was a shorter piece and it was also a, even though it seems complex on the surface, once you get to, to, to the heart of it, you realize that it's a little bit more, uh, there's more, it's more sort of straightforward than you thought it was. And so it was a little bit easier to, to, to mesh the two together, you know, as, as opposed to what yeah. you're saying, where you had to do a whole lot of brainstorming and passing back and forth. We yeah. thought she understood what the concept was and basically fit her work to, to fill the hole that was missing in it. And oh, I mean, nice. without her, Blue Hell would have never been both. It would have never even existed without her. So I'm grateful oh, to her. Really, that, what, a great job. Just, what you just said was key in, ter- in terms of her contribution. Because also the other thing that could happen, I've seen this a lot as a ghostwriter, because it's collaborations. So I've had to work with umpteenth people. But when, right. it's under my own, when it's under my own name and you're collaborating, you can make it functional. You can hammer it out. You can make it work. You can, you can blend it all together. But then there's the question of like what you're saying with Sandy or Ron, where they actually, you know, and I'm getting this implication from what you said about Ron, they actually enhance you and you enhance them. And that's an ideal oh, collaboration. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to, like, you know, there's nightmarish collaborations where you feel like you're carrying the other person on their back or maybe you're hindering what they prefer to do, you know, so. Right. Um, well, to be honest, yeah. too, I, I've not done a lot of collab- collaborations because, yeah. mostly because what I do is, is very precise. Yeah. And it's very uh, personal. Yeah. And so it's often very difficult to to do that with somebody else. Oh, um, you're not kidding. True, and stay true to that, you know. It's almost, uh, it's um, almost private on some level. It's like you, then you yeah, suddenly have exactly. to, yeah. Yeah, you suddenly yeah. have to like talk it out with some douchebag. It's like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it, there, it's not something I do with a lot of people. I mean, you and I have collaborated on some stuff, some, some yeah. screenplay stuff and stuff. And that, that, that we were, I think we work very well together. Oh, I agree. Um, yeah, we always have a blast. I mean, yeah, it's it's very. Yeah, um, it's, it, I think it's because we're both operating with intuition, and it's like a feeling. We both are just like looking at it through our third eye. It's like, I oh, guys, I see what you're doing here. What if it was like this? Right. It's not like we, it's not like we have to roll up our sleeves and discuss every choice for two hours, which uh, which really, which really <laughs> came. Yeah. yeah. Well, but also too, like you say, we're also dealing in a different area. So a novel, yeah, I yeah. think. Yeah. The, not that I don't. Th- I think we could do a novel together, but I think it would. It's oh, a likewise, lot more yeah. complicated. Yeah, wow. it's more complicated. And then it becomes a question of like, there's always that question, which is, which is all well and good because we've done novels respectively. It's like it would have to be just the right material and premise and, and structure where exactly. not only yep. do we complement each other, but we also lift each other up. Yeah, right. And that's yeah. not always easy to find, Eric. You know what I mean? That's, oh, no question. In fact, about it. in fact, it's actually very hard to find. You know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's an intuitive. It, there has to be an intuitive bond, and I think trust is such a big part of it too. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's Especially like Especially with Eric. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you got to watch him. Yeah, it's true. It's yeah, right. yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah. He'll be, he'll be publishing it beforehand with his name. On it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just wrote, I just wrote the intro to one of Al's books and I had to like, I had to just not move past page three because I wanted to rewrite the whole thing. I yeah. Said, I'll, 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 I'll do it his way, I guess. Yeah. 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 Well, you were kind enough to write that the Journal Stone did a, a 15 year anniversary edition of uh, the bleeding season. Yeah. Uh, in 2018. And speaking of, since these names came up, Ron wrote, was kind enough to write the introduction to that one. And you were kind enough to write the afterward. Yeah. Which was awesome. Uh, and that, that book is a total, is a full blown classic. I mean, it's uh, spellbinding. Thank so you. It's my pleasure. And, and Al also, let there be no mistake, it was my honor too in, in, with you as well. That's why he called me insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a bad way. No. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's the highest form of compliment. Yeah. 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 Right. Now, uh, okay, let's, let's move to your God machine. Um, uh, one thing I noticed about the God machine, okay, okay, so it's in the hotel room and all that, and, and the prostitute uh, takes her own life. Uh, do you make the actual scene 
a character in itself? Um, I like, think to a degree that's fair. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, that God Machine was kind of a marriage of two concepts. There was a, uh, there's a, the God, God Machine was actually a real thing. Um, there was a guy, John uh, Murray Spear, who in the 1850s was a, depending upon who he asked, was either a charlatan or a, a prophet. Uh, he was from Massachusetts. I believe they were doing it in Lynn. It was a big time for spiritualism and all that. He supposedly he claimed that these angels came to him and told him how to build this machine uh, from metal and, and wood. And if, they, if, he, if he stuck to the blueprint, the machine would come to life and it would literally summon God. And I always thought that that concept was, I remember reading about it, you know, a few years back and I just thought, Jesus, that's really good stuff. There's <laughs> some way I could use that. And I never really, you know, had anything that, that I could come up with. And then I had another concept where I wanted to write a story about loss and an anti-war thing too. Um, I had seen a, an interview with a, a couple who had, their only child, their son, had just been shipped back in a box from Iraq. And these people were just so devastated. There was this, of course, but I mean, the, and I remember the mother was, I, I don't, I've never seen anyone that broken, just so visibly just destroyed. And the father was the same, but there was something with him too, that there was something else. There was this, there was this rage in him and it wasn't anger. I mean, I'm talking rage. And I remember there was someone that was talking to him. I don't know if it was a reporter or someone that was presenting them with whatever the hell it was, but essentially they kept saying the, you know, the standard lines of, well, thank you for your, you know, your son's service. And, and every time they would say stuff like that, this guy would kind of twitch. And I thought if they don't stop this, this guy's going to, you could choke this guy, you know, <laughs> and it was just heartbreaking. And I thought they, they ended it and they went right back and then they went on to some other story. And I thought, Jesus, we're at a point where essentially children, these are 18, 19, 20 year old kids are coming home in boxes or they're coming home without their legs. They're coming home without their arms. They're coming home with their minds. They're completely just broken. That's if they're lucky still alive. I mean, we're dropping these kids into these meat grinders and, 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 and yet we're able, somehow we've gotten to a point as a society where we can just kind of say, Oh boy, that's too bad. Anyway, what's for dinner? Yeah. Yeah. That that's just okay with us. Somehow we're not demanding that this needs to stop this sort of wholesale slaughter of our children. And that I wanted to do something with that. And so that's where with God machine, the, the one story, the, the, the surface story, is about a cop who loses his daughter, his only child, he and his wife, to a roadside bomb in, in Iraq. And uh, he, as a result, he becomes an alcoholic, loses his career as a, as a policeman, and ends up as the security, uh, essentially, you know, basically a, a more or less a security guard in a, in a less than five star, let's say, Cape Cod Hotel. And, uh, you know, this young woman who's a prostitute who's clearly in trouble and needs somewhere to stay. And he sort of takes pity on her and sees not so much his daughter, but his daughter would have been that age. And he sees this sort of, you know, maybe I can help. I couldn't help my daughter. Maybe I can help her. And when she commits suicide, she does so in an extremely violent and grisly way. And it's very ritualistic and things written on the wall and blood and it's way, you know, just insane. And he decides, he sort of embarks on this journey to, to find out what happened and why she did this and to make sense of her death because he can never make sense. He can never reconcile his daughter's death. Um, and it's really about his pain and his wife's pain. It's about loss. It's about all of those things. But then there's this underlying thing. And the, the deeper he goes into trying to find out what happened to this, this prostitute, he gets into some very dark uh, areas and, and against some very dark people into some very, very bad, dark, evil things. And I don't want to give too much of the book away, but the God machine concept figures into that later on. But it's um, that was a marriage of both of those things. Um, 
Did, did you and have so struggle that was, with that yourself, like the the occult and that sort of thing? Is that sort of, sort of something that you've had personal experience with? That's why it's there? I, I will say this. I'm a Christian. Um, I'm Catholic. I'm Italian. It's the law. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not practicing. I haven't been several years. Um, I have been... I have never been into the occult into with, with, uh, in, with you know, quotations. Yeah. Um, I have been around it. Um, I have seen what it can do to people. Um, so to a degree, yes. Um, and I've known loss. And so this was a way to kind of hopefully purge some of those things, but yeah, I think there's a, there's a, you know, it depends on what you're talking about. There's, there's, there's a kind of casual, uh, uh, you know, like it's like some of the Satanism that's around now is kind of like, okay, I guess you could call it that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but but um, there's a difference between that and there are some very, very dark forces in this world. If you don't think there are, you just, you just need to get out of the house more. Um and you can label them however you like, but I think, you know, dealing with that kind of thing is, is a whole different, it's a whole different level. Um, whatever you want to assign it to, you know, evil absolutely exists. Now, however you want to define that, however you want to, whatever box you want to put that into or category or heading you want to give it, feel free. But, um, but yeah, it's something that I think I've, I've seen to a degree. I don't want to really get into a whole lot of stuff, but no, no. Yeah. there's, there's some things that I have seen. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think it's the, 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 the short answer is yes. Okay. We're, so we're, so with this particular book, uh, what do you think you wanted people to get out of it? Was it the connection with loss? I, I, I hope so. I, I mean, I, I mean, look, I mean, if, if, First of all, I hope it's entertaining. I hope people like it. I hope they enjoy it. That's the number one thing. Because I think if you don't have that part of it, you, you're, you're, ne- you're never, you know, people aren't going to stick around long enough to get, if, you're, if there's some other deeper point, you know, if, if, if they're not going to be there long enough to get it if you don't have them with that. So, but yeah, I hope so. I mean, you know, I think you always hope for that. You know, I mean, you never really know when that's going to hit. I mean, I remember I, I, the, I wrote a book uh, called Living in the Dead a few years back. And, you know, it was a, one of the characters was a, a Vietnam vet who was badly damaged from mentally from, from that. And I based some of that. My dad had some issues from his combat experiences. And I based it, him, you know, some of his things on that. And I got this letter about a year after the book came out from a Vietnam vet who uh, said that he was, that the book really helped him. And that, that character really kind of spoke to him and, it, and he saw himself in this character and he, it really, it really helped him with some of the things he was struggling with. And I mean, that to me, like at that point I can retire, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, okay, well then, you know, I don't know how you top that, but that was so moving to, to think that something that I did could, could, could have that kind of a profound effect on somebody. So you hope that it does. If, if this helps somebody that's experienced loss, um, if it helps them in some way, great. I, I hope so. Um, but, you know, you can't ever really, you never know. But you ho- I, I certainly would hope so. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so yourself, let's talk about, uh, now if people want to get a hold of you, do you have your own website? Um, you know, I do have one. I don't know what... <laughs> I don't know what the hell the address is. Um, I don't do it, so it's out there. Some WordPress. I don't know. I need to get one. Um, I'm I'm, I'm more like I'm on social media. People can find me on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I uh, I'm on uh, the hell's the other one? Instagram. I just I just went on there. I tried. I have to. I had to start my third Instagram account because the first two. I'm glad to find stuck. Jesus, yeah. So that was a pain, but um, yeah. Well, we'll yeah, so I mean, I'm on social media. I'm available on, on my email is uh, gfgauthor at horizon.net. I'm available. 
that way. Um, well, we'll make sure it's all up there. We'll we'll f- figure it out. We'll find you, and we'll put it up yeah, on our website great. so people can find you easier. Um, how we also have uh, giveaways. Yeah, I was going to say we have some giveaways. Um, now, uh, I guess your your publishers, uh, two different ones, have agreed. Um, so, if um, I guess the first um, three emails I get will. Uh, get the um well actually you know what we'll take in the first eight emails we get uh with your name and a, and address uh we will send you a copy of uh one of uh the two new books uh, either the god machine or blue hell so that's uh that's a pleasure i'm sure i'm sure that'll go real fast yeah, and I want to thank uh, Crossroad and Macabre Inc., which is their paperback edition or, or division, for for those, and also Journal Stone uh, for the uh, uh, Blue Hell copies. A couple of great publishers I've worked with for a long time. And thank you to them. How, how is the COVID? Does it affect your writing? Um, you know, it really hasn't altered. I mean, I kind of miss going out. I miss going to bars because you know I tend to drink now and then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I, I miss that. But um, luckily, I have one in my house. Um, but I, I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, not really. I, I you know, it's kind of an. Uh, I have an office in my in my home, so I, you know, I, it hasn't really altered a, a hell of a lot. My wife has been working from home for a long time, and that's that's been kind of nice to have her home. Wow. But um, no, not really. I mean, other than it affects you know, being able to. I miss people. Yeah. I Some just people, thought because you're, you're 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 pretty um, <laughs> you're in touch with emotions and and really putting them in your book. So I, I was just wondering when it's really dark like that, you know, like the last year with all the stuff going on, if it if it would make you write even darker or or get more emotional. You know, probably I I, I yes and no. I I wrote mostly through that last year. I wrote. Uh, uh, a novel called The Gypsy Moths. It's going to be. Um, I'm actually just waiting on the contract. It's. it's uh, it'll be out in December. Um, and that's a little both. It's a very dark piece, but it's also a very hopeful piece. Um, but, and yeah, I would say that it. But I would say during that, this last sort of era, starting with Midnight Gods, as Eric talked about. I, yeah, I think it's definitely. I've tried not to make it all about that but it's to say that it would hasn't influenced it in some ways would be silly yeah i mean sure yeah. okay well it's been a great hour um we appreciate you taking the time and and oh my pleasure and talking to us um our author ha- our guest has been author greg f gafoon thank you for being here thanks thanks for having me thanks so much greg it was good talking to you to find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.